So let's come to Paul's recipe in the next few verses. Before we do, just let me um, revisit my amazing fruitcake. Because uh, the thing I love about this cake is that the recipe is so simple. All you need is 400 grams of mixed fruit, some herbal tea, two cups of self-raising flour, one cup of brown sugar, and one egg. Now, I think uh, one of the keys to making this such a, a wonderful cake is that you take that mixed fruit and you soak it in your favorite herbal tea, preferably overnight. And so the, the mixed fruit gets all plump and, and it just soaks up the herbal tea. And then when you mix the red, rest of the ingredients together and uh, uh, bake them, it, it, it makes a, a, an amazing cake. The ingredients on their own don't do anything. But when you mix and bake them together, something magical happens, at least for me, my taste buds anyway. As the saying goes, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So let's look at verse, verses uh, 1 and 2 again together. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and of one mind. In other words, I think Paul is saying, you know, Philippians, you have the best ingredients for this amazing grace cake. Now, prove it. Prove it by baking the cake and baking it together. In other words, prove that you are united with Christ by being united with each other. Now, one thing to notice here is that the cooks, the Philippian Christians, are not just using a method to make the cake. They are the method. They are the method of making this amazing grace cake. Paul emphasizes here in verse 2 the need for unity in heart and in soul and in mind. He's saying that these Philippian Christians, and all Christians by implication, should have one heart, one heart. He says that we should have the same love. Now, when Paul talks about love like this, he's not talking about romance, but he's talking about what, uh, what, he, taught, what he refers to in Romans 5, verse 5, as God's love that's been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. God's love. You know, nothing matters more in our relationships than love and loving each other. Paul's uh, colleague, the Apostle Peter, says this in his first letter, above all, above all, love each other deeply. It's the most important thing, loving each other. And Paul says we should have the same love for each other. Now, in his world, that word same would have been horrifying because Society was established on a highly uh, structured basis. People were kind of ranked according to their social status. And people understood that, and that's the way it was. And so for, people to say, for Paul to say, you know, we should all have the same love, we should all be equal in love, we should be the same, would have been horrifying to his culture. But... That's the revolutionary message of the gospel. Well, what about our world? Do we have that kind of idea of equality, of sameness, if you like? Well, I think there's a lot of talk, especially recently. And over my lifetime, I guess I've heard lots and lots of talk about this idea of equality. But the progress in our world seems to be incredibly slow. And that's where we as the church should be setting the example showing the way, because Christ's love conquers all. Christ's love breaks down every barrier. Christ's love enables every person to stand equal before God and before every other human. And so we should have the same love. We should have one heart. But Paul goes on and says that we should have one soul. He says that, uh, he uses the phrase being one in spirit, and that 
phrase literally means, uh, or should, could be literally translated as one soul. And it's probably, Paul is probably making a reference here to some ancient proverbs that were used by Aristotle, who lived, I think, in the 4th century before Christ. And Aristotle used to quote some ancient well-known proverbs. For example, when he was asked what a friend is, he said, a friend is a single soul dwelling in two bodies. A single soul dwelling in two bodies. He said things like friends' goods are common property. Friendship is equality. And so there was this idea of, of, of sharing one soul that Paul is making a reference to here. And I think what he's saying is Christians, you people at Philippi and whichever church you're in, really, Christians are to live in harmony with one another and to treat each other equally. Christians are to share their resources with one another because we are one soul. We are to have unity in heart and in soul. And then Paul says, uh, unity in mind. He says you should have one mind. In fact, there are two phrases here in verse 2. He says that we should be like-minded and of one mind. And both of those phrases use the same Greek verb, which is the verb to think. And the phrase could be more literally translated as uh, to think or think the same thing. Think the same thing. Think the one thing is, is kind of the, the, uh, the emphasis behind this phrase. And you might say, well, how is this possible that we all think the same thing or the one thing? Because there are so many different opinions. Uh, just in our church, Craigie Baptist Church, let alone every other church and the whole church worldwide. Well, the word think here is not just about um, accumulating knowledge or processing information. It's not just a kind of a head knowledge thing. It's actually the Greek word includes the idea of behavior. So in other words, how you think is inseparable from how you act and how you behave. So Paul, I think what Paul is not saying here is you need to have the same opinions on every issue. But rather, I think he's saying you need to have the same mind towards how you behave, the same commitment to godly behavior, even when you disagree, and perhaps especially when you disagree. You see, when we have differences of opinion and when we have disagreements, even about theological things, our primary and uh, first priority must be to love the other person not to be right. How easy is it for us when we have a disagreement that our first inclination is we just want to be right and we want to prove that we're right. But actually, our primary concern should be to love the other person, not to prove that we are right. Now, these might sound like really lofty ideals, but Paul grounds them in the next two verses, three verses three and four, where he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And what we can see in these two verses are two really important qualities that we as followers of Christ should be pursuing in our lives. The first quality is humility. We are to pursue humility rather than vanity. Now, in the first century world, in Paul's world, people actually craved honour, not humility, because humility wasn't seen as a virtue. Humility was seen as being really equivalent to humiliation. And so people pursued honour. And their self-worth was based on the opinions of other people. Now, Paul says, when he uses the phrase vain conceit, it, it literally means empty opinion. It's like Paul is saying, don't worry about what other people think, because in a sense, their opinions don't hold anything for you. They don't hold any value for you, because your self-worth is not based, should not be based on what other people think of you, but primarily what God thinks of you, what God says of you. And so Paul urges this attitude 
of humility. But he, but he also um, urges an action, which is where he says that we should value others above ourselves. Value others above yourselves, he says. And what does he mean by that? I don't think he means that we are worth less than other people because our worth is based on what God says of us. But rather, he's saying that our consideration for others must precede our concern for ourselves. And I think this second quality that we should pursue here helps to clarify this. So first of all, we need to pursue humility rather than vanity. But secondly, he says we should pursue servanthood rather than selfishness. Now, I think that all of us who are followers of Christ would agree that we are called to be servants, not to be selfish. But Paul's words sound really hard. In fact, in fact quite harsh in verse 4. He says, uh, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And some translations find that so kind of uh, grating that they translate it a bit differently. Uh, like this, don't look to your own interests, don't look only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. But in the Greek, there's, there's no, uh, you know, only but also. It's just simply blunt. Don't look to your own interests, but each of you look to the interests of others. It does sound harsh, but I think Paul is trying to make a point here. I think Paul knew what Jesus said when he was asked about the two greatest commandments. He said that the first commandment is to love God, but the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. So the loving of your neighbor is kind of graded by the love of yourself. So Paul here is not denigrating self-care, but rather he's, he's trying to declare or make the point that our primary focus, the primary focus of the Christian life should be others not ourselves. It should be others, not self. Why? Because church unity is destroyed by self-absorption, but it is strengthened by self-sacrifice. Church unity is annihilated by narcissism, but built up by compassion and self-giving. One of the concerns I have in church life in Australia, in my experience over almost 30 years of ministry, is that we have such a consumer approach to church. We so often think and talk about what we want out of services, what we want out of church. People shop around to different churches trying to find th things that, or services or ministries that meet their needs. And I can understand why that is. But it's quite an insidious thing. And really, the approach should not be, what has this church got for me that helps meet my needs? But, but rather, how can I serve? How does God want me to serve in this place and meet the needs of others? And if you have that kind of attitude, that kind of approach, humility, not vanity, servanthood, not selfishness, you will help to contribute to this amazing grace cake, this wonderful cake full of ingredients that, that are combined together in unity that says to the world, hey world, come and taste and see that God is good. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much that the founder of this thing called the church prayed for us 2,000 years ago. And he prayed that we would be one, that we would be united like the Trinity is united, like the Father and the Son are united and the Holy Spirit as well. And I pray, Lord, that we would as a church at Craigie Baptist Church experience a growing sense of unity and that as we partner together with Cross Culture Church we will see practical expressions of that unity and that more importantly that our community around the Craigie Baptist Church facility will see and will be able to taste that God is good 
because of the unity that we are experiencing and expressing. I pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.